Hi, welcome to Silver Lens. It is uh, 8 p.m. or roundabouts here in Manila. Um, you are here for a walkthrough with Pio Abad, who is in London. Hi, Pio. And Isa, who's already in the space. Um, this is a walkthrough of Pasita Abad's show, Masks and Spirits. Uh, before that, before I take you there, a few house rules. We request that you mute your microphone while the presentation is uh, going on. Should you have any questions, we have a chat box. You can type it in, in there. And then at the end, we have a question and answer portion that will uh, the, address those questions. Uh, for full disclosure, I'm letting you know that we are recording all of this. Let me walk you over a little bit about uh, the gallery as we walk to the space. We have in our big space here a uh, show, Ziggurat by Norberto Roldan. We all know him as Pee Wee Roldan. And um, these pe uh, Pee Wee is a very respected senior artist who works with found objects and archives. He takes um, bits from old houses before they were torn down to make way for large real estate projects. Imagined lives in space and shape of Mesopotamian ziggurats, a metaphor for our immeasurable time of epic change. His works have been entered in important collections from the Singapore Art Museum to the Guggenheim in New York. So let's take you to Pasita. Thanks, Rach. Can you hear me? Can people hear me? Hi, hi everyone. Thank you for joining us in this walkthrough. My name is Isa Lorenzo, and that was my partner, Rachel Rillo, who took you through the galleries and into this room of Pasita. So um, I wanted to welcome you to this on-site show of Pasita Abad's Masks and Spirits, a show that is also online until tomorrow at the Art Basel 20th Century Viewing Room. And um, uh, three things, I wanted to give you three things about Pasita. So the first is uh, Pasita really was studying to be a lawyer. And she went to San Francisco in 1973 to take up further law studies only to become a hippie, okay? So this was a very important uh, fact about Pasita because she was supposed to be the politician in her family. Another fact about Pasita Abad is that in 1973 onwards, she took a year to hitchhike from Turkey to the Philippines. So what kind of person would do that? This is, a, she was in her early 20s and she spent a year, she went through places like Afghanistan and India, throughout Southeast Asia, and found her way back to the Philippines. The third thing I wanted to tell you about Pasita is a word called trapunto. Now, not many of you may have known or have heard about what a trapunto is, but it is actually an Italian word that means between two points. So it is a, it is a way of um, sewing wherein you put two pieces of cloth together and you sew point to point, very much like quilting. So this is, this is the, the method that Pasita was using uh, to make the majority of her works. Now, I wanted to um, introduce Pasita to you. So let's roll the video. So Pasita is a late Filipino-American artist who lived in many parts of the world. Manila, San Francisco, Sudan, Jakarta, Washington, DC. She was born in Batanes, northernmost province of the Philippines, a stone's throw away from Taiwan. And she passed away in 2004 in Singapore. Being married to a developmental economist, a life of itinerant travel was in the offing. Pasita was an artist ahead of her time. Filipina, female, global. She lived and traveled to numerous countries, all the while making art that gathered cross-cultural practice. So that's Pasita, Filipina, female, global. Now I wanted to introduce the show Masks and Spirits to you. Masks and Spirits lifts its title from her celebrated series of the same name. It features large-scale trapunta paintings 
made from 1982 through 1994 in this selection in the gallery. But in reality, she started this in the late 70s all the way up to right before she passed away. It was during her time in Africa in the late 70s that prompted her to begin painting masks and spirits. It was here where she began to experiment with a medium that came to identify her practice, trapunto paintings. Inspired by tribal masks from around the world, um, world's remote, most remote areas, Abad created over 50 of these large, hand-stitched, colorfully embellished trapunto works in her lifetime. This series was a turning point in Abad's artistic approach. Not only did the scale of her works change, her aesthetic style likewise shifted from figurative realism to mystical abstract figuration. Today, I am very, very happy to be joined by Pio Abad. Pio, as you probably know, is one of our Silverlands artists. And um, he, in the context of today's talk, is more importantly, Pasita's nephew. So a little bit about Pio. Pio was born in Manila in 1983, and he lives and works in London. He began his art studies at the University of the Philippines before receiving a BA from Glasgow School of Art and an MA from the Royal Academy Schools, London. He has recently exhibited at the Honolulu Biennale in Hawaii, the Gwangju Biennale in South Korea, Art Basel Encounters Hong Kong in 2017, Parasite Hong Kong, Cadiz Paris, the Center for Asian Art in Sydney, the EVA International Biennale in Limerick, in 2016, and so on. Pia Abad's practice is concerned with the social and political signification of things. His work in a range of media include textiles, drawings, installation, and photography. And it uses strategies of appropriation to mine alternative or repressed historical events, unravel official events, official accounts, and draw out threads of complicity between incidents, ideologies, and people. Often taking the form of domestic accessories, Abad's artworks glide seamlessly between these histories, enacting quasi-fictional combinations with their leftovers. Again, most importantly, in the context of tonight's event, Pio is Pasita's nephew, curator, and consultant to the estate. So Pio, hello. Hey, Isa. Hi, everyone. Um, I guess good evening uh, to Manila and um, Good afternoon to people in London and in this part of the world. Um, yeah, thanks for inviting me to uh, be part of this presentation. And um, I'm, I'm really happy with the show. And actually, a lot of the works that are in the exhibition are works that I haven't um, seen before. And, and I think it's a, it's a testament to how prolific Pasita is that, you know, there's, there's just so much of these amazing pieces that, um, that the public are finally able to see af after you know, quite a long period in hibernation. So this is um, a photo by Wig, Wig Deismans of Pasita in front of a mask, of a mask painting. Go ahead, Pio. Yeah, I guess, I mean, you, you've done a, a, a really good introduction to Pasita. Um, and I think, I think I just want to add, you know, I mean, who is, who is Pasita bad? Um, I think for me, she was, she was always the most interesting and the most colorful person in the room. Um, and, you know, it, it, I, it's always sort of um, bittersweet being in this position of talking about her work and, um, you know, talking about her life because, you know, you'd always wish that, uh, you know, while, while it's, it's amazing that, that people globally are, are becoming aware of her practice, there was always for me that wish that she was around to be able to talk about them. Um, but in the meantime, I will try um, to do justice to her practice and to, to the story of her life, really. Um, and it's, it's for me, it's, it's a real kind of, I, there's a sense, I, I feel very honored to be in this position. Um, and I think this evening, it would be good to just go through some of the works um, in the exhibition and through these works sort of, um, I guess travel through, jo join Pasita in her travels and kind of talk about how 
how this particular body of work became really crucial in um, in the development of her of her of her practice as an artist. Um, I guess yeah, just just to start off, um, I think it's important to note, as you as you mentioned um, earlier, that um, that the Mass and Spirit series were Pasita's um, first um, Trapunto paintings. Um, and prior to that, she was doing a lot of, um, I guess, more um, conventional works, oils and oil and canvases, and drawings. Um, but I think as she traveled the world and as she accumulated all these experiences with different communities and gathered all these um, different materials, she was able to develop this this very idiosyncratic um, visual language that then you know accompanied her throughout her life. Um, so I guess to begin, um, this work, um, Om Derman, um, is the title of the work is from a town in Sudan that Pasita actually um, visited in, in the late 70s. Um, I think Pasita first um, went to the African continent in 1979 um, and she, she was accompanying her um, husband, um, Jack Garrity, um, on a series of aid missions. Um, I think Jack at the time was working with USAID. Um, and they, they traveled to Kenya, to Sudan, to South Sudan and the Congolese border. Um, and I, I guess that's something really important um, in understanding Pasita's work, that a lot of the research and a lot of, of the travel that she did was in the context of of accompanying um, someone doing development work. And also she had a lot of friends who were working um, as part of UNHCR or, um, or part of um, my, my other aunt, um, Vicky actually worked for the Red Cross. Um, so that kind of, that context of being, being amongst development workers and, and being amongst people working with refugees really informed her practice and um, and I guess that shaped the sense of the sense of empathy to these to the different communities that are depicted in her work, and to the to the sensitivity she has with the uh, with the materials that she was um, using from these specific contexts. Um, I think that yeah, so Omdurman would have been one of the earlier Trapunto works because it was made in eighty two. I think the first one she ever did was a work called African Mephisto, which is currently actually on show at the, um, at the Berlin Biennial. But I think what's, what's interesting about this particular work is, um, is it's not, it's, it's very, so, it, so it's, you can see the stitching and you can see the quilting, but the, the embellishment I think happens later. Um, and I think what's also important to point out, um, going back to, to where Pasita was when she was beginning to, to put together this work. Um, you know, she was spending a lot of time in different countries, different borders, in fact. Um, and the idea for, for Trapunto, one of, the, one of the main inspirations for this way of creating these, these I guess, these very portable works. I mean, they, they actually roll up and um, like quilts was, um, a time she spent um, at a Tibetan refugee camp in Nepal in 1974. Um, and she was really taken with the, um, the, the Tanka tapestry pieces. Um, and she was drawn to the colors, to the stories and the scale of these works, but it was the, the portability that kind of, um, that attracted her the most, I think. And also, I guess, fit into into the life that she was starting to lead where, where um, they constantly moved around. I think over a period of 10 years, they, they ended up living in four, three or four different continents. Um, so yeah, but uh, Omdurman is, is one of the first Trapunto works um, and it was inspired by um, the time she spent, um, I think she was actually living with fellow Filipinos um, working um, in a small town called Wow, I hope I'm saying that right, in WAU in Sudan. Um, and it was 
I think a four month visit there in, in 79, where she started kind of looking at these tribal masts, looking at, looking at the materials. Um, and another series um, of works that kind of developed around the same time, part of these masts and spirits works was um, the Bakongo series, um, a couple of which will we'll go on show um, at, at Tate Liverpool um, next month. From Africa, I guess we then moved to um, Oceania, Papua New Guinea. Here we have Hagen Man. So Hagen Man yes. hangs across Omdurman in the gallery. In the show, on, in the space, we have four works hanging in our corner gallery. Uh, and the range of works is from 1982 to 1994. So Pasitas Hagen is next on the list. Pio? Yeah. Yeah, so um, Pasita traveled to Papua New Guinea in the early 80s. Um, and I think at that time, again, it was in relation to Jack working with the, with the local government in PNG um, to do some um, infrastructure work at Port Moresby. Um, and I think it just so happened um, at that time that Pasita's godmother um, from Batanes um, happened to be living in Papua New Guinea as well. Um, living in the coastal city of Ley with, uh, with her family. Um, and so Pasita visited um, her grandmother, uh, sorry, grandmother, her godmother, um, and actually spent a lot of time then traveling and visiting different Filipino communities who were living in um, Papua New Guinea at that time. Um, and that's what kind of allowed her to sort of, I guess, go off and and explore and visit different areas of, of the country at that time. And she was really drawn with, with the culture of embellishment um, that was um, present um, in kind of indigenous artifacts. And, um, and you can see with these particular works that, you know, that there's, there's a lot of cowrie shells, which, which she kind of took from, from um, the visual tradition of, of of Papua New Guinea. Um, and I think when she, she got back to Manila, she then started thinking about adding more material to, um, to the Trapuntos. Um, yeah, she was living in Manila by that time as well. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep jumping between cities because yeah, go mean, ahead. there was a lot of traveling at that yes, time. Yes. Um, and actually these, these cowrie shells are, are drilled individually and then sewn um, piece by piece onto the fabric. And I think it's important to note um, when looking at these works that Pasita largely worked on her own, um, but sometimes with the help of family members. Um, like in, I think in this instance, it was my uncle who was drilling each, each um, seashell. Um, and that all the works are hand sewn. Um, I think she was saying that she each trapunto usually took about six to eight weeks to complete, but she would also be working um, on multiple ones, you know, from up to five trapuntos um, all at once. Um, I think, you know, the cowrie shells were important in developing the language of trapunto painting further because it allowed her to be more omnivorous in, in um, the material she was incorporating um, on the surfaces of these paintings. Um, and as, as she traveled even more, and as she, as she gained confidence in, in developing this, this, this process, more and more uh, material um, kind of became part of, of, of her practice. Um, I was reading, I, I found a list that she made of, of some of the, the materials that she'd incorporated in, in various trapuntos. Um, and it, it's, quite, it's quite breathtaking. I'll just sort of run through them. Um, so there's Mola from the San Blas Islands of Panama, um, Drapo banners from Haiti, Huipil from Guatemala and Mexico, Cuba and Rafia textiles from Congo, embroidery from Afghanistan, rally quilts from Pakistan, Kalaga from Burma, Kanta from Bangladesh, mirrors from India, seashells from the Philippines and the South Pacific, bark cloth from Papua New Guinea in Northern Australia, batik and ikat from Indonesia, and mud cloth from West Africa. Wow, that's encyclopedic. Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting when, you know, when people talk about 
uh, transnational, transnational art, and um, and and you know, it's very much embedded within within the language of contemporary art discourse now. That you know, the, the sort of the transnational way of production. It, I think in in Pasita's work, it, it's pretty remarkable that that transnationalism actually is present in the surface of the work. It's it's not just a sensibility, but it's actually embedded within the material um, of each piece. Um, and, and Bia, if, if I may ask, yeah. um, would she mix and match these, um, you know, these 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 uh, these skills or these technical elements, or would she sort of be, um, you know, uh, stick to one for one trampunto and and you know, so was it or was it something that she'd like to hodgepodge altogether? I think with these mass and spirit paintings, I think she kept to the traditions that she was representing. But I think okay. as the work evolved with, with the later series, the immigrant experience works and the more kind of later abstracts, you can see that that they start kind of these traditions stop blurring um, with one another. These techniques just start overlapping and, and it's it becomes I think she while she's respectful of the traditions that she's referencing, it also becomes very much a part of her own visual language. Um, Right, right. Were these pieces, um, I'm just curious, in her lifetime, were these pieces in circulation? Um, I think that's the, that's the important thing to note. Obviously, um, over the last few years, um, her work has gained a lot more visibility um, in various biennials, in various art fairs, and various sort of exhibitions. Um, but these works were very much um, shown um, while she was alive, um, just not through the channels that perhaps the Western art world then was familiar with. Um, for instance, one of the, um, the Bakongo works, um, the first one in fact, um, was shown as part of the second um, Havana Biennial and it's actually in the collection of, of the uh, Belles Artes Museum in, uh, in Cuba. And you know there was some work sh shown at um, the Fukuoka Triennial. Um, I think an, a couple of works are actually owned by the National Gallery in Indonesia. And in my research, interestingly, I found that she was part of an exhibition in Indonesia um, called um, "Contemporary Art from Non-Aligned Countries." Um, Non-Aligned Countries. Um, and I think one of the works in that show, um, I'm, I'm still trying to sort of trace provenances, actually then became part of um, the collection of art from non-aligned countries, which was uh, then uh, located in uh, Titograd in former, U in, in Yugoslavia then, but now it's uh, in um, Northern Macedonia. I mean, we haven't, we haven't found the exact whereabouts of one of these works, but, but I and, think- And that what years, yeah, what years was, was were these? This, so this, this uh, particular show? Yeah, mid 80s to the mid 90s. I believe the, the, okay. line show was the early 90s. Um, yeah, so the works did travel. And I think the kind of, the trajectories that they, that they kind of moved through during her lifetime was also kind of a, a good way of showing the, the parallel sort of um, movements of art um, in the global South. Um, at that time, I guess before before this kind of um, more global um, art world that we are familiar with now. I mean, obviously that's sort of currently in flux given given the sort of pandemic situation. Um, and I think it's also important to point out that actually the the series was shown in in a major exhibition. Um, in 1990, so the, the culmination of the Mass and Spirit series um, was a monumental, ins monumental installation in Washington, D.C. Um, called Six Masks um, from Six Continents. And it was on display um, at the Washington, D.C. Metro Center for, I think, for three years. Because I remember um, I would have been 10 at that time, and we were living in the States, and, and Pasita had organized um, a tour bus that really was, I think she won it in a raffle or something. Um, and she organized for the whole family. I mean, the, I have quite a lot of family living in, in the East Coast to, to kind of get a tour of DC. And then we all ended up sort of viewing um, the, the, this big installation 
um, and in, in the in the metro. Um, and this would have been um, early early ninety three, I think. So that's when we were living living there at the time. Um, oh, yeah. Wait, and which are the pieces? Um, they were which of the masks and spirit pieces were in that show? Uh, if there were six. Hopi mask. And what were the which, continents? I guess um, so all there, of the continents except Antarctica. Continents, and, yeah. Um, there's Hopi mask. There is uh, Congo. There is, I think, dancing demon and European mask, which actually was initially part of the uh, Bakongo series, but then she'd sort of changed it um, for mm -hmm. this particular installation. Um, so I think three three of the works that were part of that installation are currently on show at the Berlin Biennial. And then one of them will be on show um, at Tate Liverpool next month. Um, and then maybe we can move on to the third one. Yeah. It, it's different for me in, in that it, yeah, it actually, I think, you know, in all these discussions of Placita's work, there's so much focus, understandably, on, on her itineracy, on, you know, on the breadth of, of travel. Um, but I think it's also important to note how rooted she was in her place of birth, um, which is the small island of Batanes um, in the northernmost part of the Philippines. And this particular work um, on reaching 37 um, actually depicts a couple dancing the pandango, which is the traditional folk dance um, in Batanes. Basita deeply identified with um, Ivatan culture. I, I think it never, she, you know, she spoke the, it's not a dialect, she spoke the language. Um, and I think, I think the strong indigenous culture in Batanes that has re remained largely intact, perhaps because of, it, of its sort of remoteness and, and, and it's, it being topographically different from, from the country, it, it resembles more of like a, a Scottish island than, um, than a tropical sort of Philippine beach. Um, and I think she really took that with her. Um, and I think that's something that maybe is important to note that, you know, the, the really the influence of, 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 of the kind of singularity of Ivatan, Ivatan culture um, in her work. And then in relation to, I guess, her work as, you know, disseminating um, across different cultures, I mean, it, it's sort of recently, um, anthropologists have sort of, archaeologists have identified Batanis as this important point in the spread of Austronesian culture. Um, they call it the funnel through which um, Austronesian culture traveled from Taiwan and then spread through the Pacific to Southeast Asia and Oceania. Um, so I Pacific think people, if I may interrupt, uh, just yeah. a geography lesson. So yeah. Taiwan uh, is a stone's throw away from Batanes. So in yeah. fact, uh, you can hear Taiwanese radio from Batanes. And in fact, and, um, Ivatan, which is the local language, has a lot more in common with the uh, language spoken in Lanyu, which is the southernmost island of, of Taiwan. Um, and so yeah. I think... In, towards the end of her life, actually, Pasita wanted to, um, to move there. Um, and so she, she built a house and she built a studio um, in the early 2000s. But unfortunately, um, yeah, she succumbed to um, cancer before she really got to, to use the house. Um, yeah, and I think, I guess, I, I mean, I, I really love this painting uh, at this particular point in my life as well, uh, on a more kind of personal note. Um, because it's called On Reaching 37, um, and I am 37 at the moment. And, um, and I think I think about the ways that uh, Pasita has shaped my own life as an artist. Um, I think she, you know, I think having an artist in the family makes you realize that it is, it is a, you know, it's possible to, to live the life of an artist. Um, and I think she impressed upon me um, the importance of travel and the importance of, um, of finding my own way. But actually, Pasita mm -hmm. hunted for art schools um, for me. Really? Um, which is how I ended up uh, moving from Manila to Glasgow 15 years ago. Um, 
And I think, yeah, I think, I think this is kind of a, yeah, it's interesting looking at this painting and it becoming this sort of uh, strange sort of palimpsest of, of her life and, and, and mine in a way. Um, yeah, well, that's, I didn't know that. I think um, the line between you and Pasita is strong. I mean, the, you know, no, not just genetically, but also the vi visual line between the two of you. Um, it's been really uh, interesting to hear about all of these backstories on these three pieces. And I really just wish people could see this work in person because standing in front of them, they're really quite monumental. I mean, they're, yeah. they're over two meters. They're almost uh, 220 or 230 um, tall. And um, to know that Pasita was, was a tiny person, was a tiny woman, and she made these pieces uh, in this scale really showed an ambition that was way ahead of her time. Uh, and, and uh, you know, I, I wanted to just interject that there's a, there is a, she received an award in the late 90s. Was it the late 90s, P.O.? It was the, the 80s. T -O, it was in the 80s. The T-O-Y-M. Yeah. And um, the, the, the award is T-O-Y-M because it stands for the 10 Outstanding Young Men of the Philippines. And she was the first woman to receive it. And yeah. there was quite an uproar. There was quite an uproar. But, you know, she broke, she broke that ceiling. And today, yeah. it's, it's standard, you know? It, it, it's, it's an award given to both men and women. Well, I, I remember reading in, in going through her archives, I remember reading this article um, that I think it was a Filipino, a, a really, really livid Filipino art critic. Um, accusing uh, TOIM, you know, have, have they have they reached um, the end of their wits as to have the audacity to award the 10 outstanding young men to a woman? Um, it's <laughs> incredible, no? It's quite this hilarious. Really, it's yeah. As well. <laughs> but I, I guess we, we, I, we really wanted to show that Pasita broke all the boundaries. Yeah. Um, not just for herself, but for women in the Philippines and for artists as well, because I don't, uh, I'm pressed to find an artist who worked um, this prolifically and this uh, freely, mm. you know, um, as, as Pasita. Um, the world has actually really opened up to Pasita ever since her MCAD or Museum of Contemporary Art and Design show here in Manila, curated by Joselina Cruz and Pio, were showing pictures of that show. And um, after that, after that show, we were fortunate enough to celebrate her pieces at Art Basel in Hong Kong with a cabinet presentation. And um, it, after that, we we had a um, we had a the, the chance to show Pasita at Freeze London in the woven section curated by our friend at Parasite, Cosmin Costinas, and so on. You know, after that, um, there was a magnificent solo exhibition in Spike Island and in Bristol curated by Robert Lecky and Pio, which opened right before the lockdown happened. So I think we, the show was open for. We managed to have two, two months. Two months. The show's open for yeah. two months, but it was supposed to run for four or five months. Uh, three and a bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, I remember making plans to, to head to London in March um, to see that show and to attend Pio's talk, but, you know, things happen. Um, mm -hmm. Anyway, um, her pieces now are up at the Berlin Biennale. Uh, there are seven pieces from the Masks and Spirits series. So if anyone uh, is heading over to Berlin, or you can also see them online. Uh, and next week or next month, um, three pieces that have entered the collection of the Tate will be on show at the Tate Liverpool. And we're very excited for that. I hope that it actually opens and um, Shout out to uh, Clara, who's a friend of ours and a friend of Pio's, who, who is the curator, who, who sort of championed this, this work. So Pio, after this, this, this roller coaster whirlwind, you know, run of the world by Pasita, what's next? 
So I think immediately next is the Guangzhou Biennial, which will be curated by um, Natasha Jinwala and Daphne Ayas. Um, and that will be in, that was supposed to be in October, um, or September, um, but it's moved to February. Um, okay. There was also a parasite exhibition um, that I think just finished. Um, and we're in the midst of um, putting together uh, a sort of very late catalog, um, but I'm very excited that it's finally going to happen of, of the MCAT exhibition that kind of kind of would introduce new scholarship um, around Pasita's uh, work. Um, and there's there's the Kathmandu Triennial, which is also scheduled to, I mean, a lot of these exhibitions were actually supposed to happen this year, obviously, but everything sort of calendars up in the air. Um, and there will also be, yeah, there, there's a lot more um, in the cards. So do, do watch this space. <laughs> Nice, nice. So we have um, the floor open to questions um, from the audience. There's, I see a lot of people, I mean, there are people from New York, people from London, uh, people from Hong Kong, from Singapore, uh, from Manila, of course. Um, I, I, I'm just gonna go through, we have time for maybe three questions. Is that okay, Pio? Yeah, sure. Okay, so um, we have a question from Noel Bonoan, who's asking, um, who were her artistic influences? Hmm. Um, yeah, I think I think it's sort of I think the the kind of the materials, um, you know, there there she kind of was influenced by so many different different artists, really. Um, when she was in, you know, when she was in living in DC, um, she she encountered artists like Alma Thomas. Um, uh, she she very much uh, was uh, taken by um, Emile Nold's work, which um, that may be quite controversial. Um, and um, who else? Would, there's Faith Ringgold. Um, and I think in terms of, of whether she was an artist from a young age, um, I think that sensibility was always there, but it didn't really, I think it, it's a process perhaps, I mean, to decide. Right, right. And I think it was the confidence of, um, of actually living in San Francisco surrounded by, I think she was living in San Francisco at the height of the summer of love in, in, in Haight Ashbury. Um, and I think- right. That, that sense of freedom of that moment and of that particular place really encouraged her to to leave the life of a lawyer, which actually she hadn't even really started yet, and to embrace right. that life of an artist. Um, yes, I, I, I actually we were on an OVR walkthrough yesterday with uh, Indian uh, the Indian uh, VIPs for Art Basel, and. Um, uh, one of them asked about that, like how did her family feel that she left, you know, or she, she sort of changed track. And uh, yeah. the answer was, you know, when, when your child, when art hits your child, when art takes your child, art takes your child. <laughs> so would you say the same, Pio? I guess so. I think, I, I think for a time they were really, I think, I remember speaking to some of her, um, her classmates from the University of the Philippines when she was still studying political science, I think. And some of them were quite surprised that she became an artist. Um, really? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think the first, the first few exhibitions were actually, um, I think she had one Manila, Gar you know, what Doucet Hotel is now. Uh, right, Manila, yeah, the old Manila Garden. She showed like, some still lives and some, oh. I think some early, some of the very early drawings she did of, while living in um, in in Banglad in Bangladesh or visiting Dhaka at that time and and they, it, it was I think people were quite surprised that suddenly you know she was an artist but right. I think knowing you know I think my family my my dad's side everyone's always had a creative streak um, so I think that has always been present. Um, but maybe it, it obviously it got more pronounced over time. Uh, right. Uh, thank you for your question, Noel. Our next question is from Judy Freya Sibayan. What is the new scholarship being written on her work? 
So we're commissioning um, some essays that are actually, I think what I've found um, in, in the writings about Pasita um, is there's been a lot of kind of these broad overviews where, where everyone seems to like listing things. So I, and, and I find myself doing the same, you know, you list the countries that she's visited, you list the, the subject matter that she's covered, you list the material. And I think what's really important um, is to actually have um, texts that focus on very specific bodies of work. And this is what um, we're trying to focus on. So essays specifically on, on the masks and spirits, um, uh, writing that's specific to uh, the underwater works, um, and also writing that's specific to the time um, she spent living in Southeast Asia. I think what, what's interesting um, about Pasita um, is she, I think, bar a couple of years in the early 80s where she lived in Manila. Um, she had a studio in, in Pasay City in one of those kind of uh, white and green American style houses back in the day. Um, that actually, it was, it was in Indonesia um, and Singapore where she was really the most prolific. And there's something about this idea of proximity and distance that she was near enough to the Philippines, but not actually in the Philippines, but still kind of able to visit but then still have that distance to be able to produce work that isn't necessarily tied specifically to the Philippine context that, that allowed her to have this really open practice. Um, so those are, the, those are the kind of three specific kind of avenues of research that we're currently um, putting together. And I think it's, it's also, you know, as her work becomes more visible globally, I think what's interesting is to get you know, different um, curators, um, different writers, um, to really to look at her work and and examine it through through so very different lenses. Um, because, right to get people to respond to yeah. the work. Yeah, yeah, that's that's great. So thank you for your question, um, Judy. Our next question is from Lara Baklig. Has the art world changed since Pasita's time when she received some? criticism for producing just craft pieces and not real art. That's in quotes. I, I really, I, 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 I hope so. <laughs> um, I think that that conversation around craft and that conversation around um, tradition, um, you know, traditional, traditional techniques is interesting. And I think as the world has expanded, it's become more open to to really, to what the definitions of contemporary art are. Um, right, right. The shifting, the shifting sands of the art world, you know, is, you know, manifested by the level of interest that curators and collectors and, and students um, and fellow artists have, have had, you know, everyone is so, I think what's, what's really heartening about being involved in in, in, you know, in, in sharing Pasita's art to the world is, is really the response of, of, diff, of people from different walks of life, that they, they, the spirit of generosity and that sense of freedom that's in each work is somehow reflected back to the viewer. Um, like when, when, when one of the things I enjoy the most after um, installing a show and when the show's open is to actually watch people look at, look at her work and, and it's amazing that people look at her trapuntos, I guess because of their scale as well, they kind of just sit down in front of it and they watch it like it's a film. <laughs> right, um, right, right. And, you know, that time, it, it, it's sort of, because the works are so generous, they also like invite the viewer to be generous to the work. Right. That's, that's very true. I mean, we've, mm -hmm. we've been open for the last uh, two weeks and we're going to be open until November 21 by appointment. And people have been coming to see the show in droves. Um, and it's so, you know, when they come into the room, they, it's like they let out a big sigh and they all say, Ang ganda, <laughs> which is so beautiful in Tagalog. So um, I think we're out of time. I uh, just wanted to say, uh, you know, Pio and I dressed in our Pasita best. 
And this so, is Pio, can you show picture. can you show us your uh, pasita best? Uh, there you go. There you go. All the colors. <laughs> then I'm going to show my pasita best. <laughs> so this was a shirt given to me by Jack, which I wear with pride only on occasion because it is a collector's item at this point. I need to ask him why I didn't, why I didn't get one for this for this event. <laughs> I'm sure he has one for you when you see each other again. Um, so for any inquiries, um, we are available at info at silverlandsgalleries.com or just send us a message uh, via our social media channels. Uh, please do follow us on social media at Silverlands Galleries on IG and FB. Visit our website. Uh, if you haven't signed up to our newsletter, please do. Um, I would like to ask Pio to say maybe one last thing that we can all take away Ooh, about Pasita. I, um, I would say, I think maybe we can end with, I mean, I, I always really love, um, I'm gonna go find it. Uh, there's a really beautiful um, Faith, Ring, Faith Ringgold, the African-American artist wrote um, a short text on, um, on Pasita, and I think it's sort of, it's such a, a good uh, piece of text. And th there's a particular quote that I'd kind of like to end with, if you bear with me a little bit. Um, we are live also on the Art Basel OVR 20C, which is now open to the public. Uh, it is a, the Art Basel OVR 20C is a group of 100 galleries from around the world, all showing art made in the 20th century. Uh, Pasita stands tall and proud amongst all of them. Uh, she is, I must say, one of the few female Global South Filipina artists. Actually, she's the only Filipina artist in the show. Um, but yeah, she stands tall and proud for all of us. Yeah, so there's, yeah, there's a quote from Faith Ringgold writing about Pasita, um, where she says, widely traveled, Abad creates her own work from the point of view of an, an international woman of color. Those of us who have traveled extensively know that creative women of color are working all over the world and are not merely minority figures within the narrow confines of the Western art world. That's Faith Ringgold on Pasita Abad. I think it's a... Amen. Also, <laughs> just, just a, I, if I may, just a parting thought. You know, a lot, of, a lot of art history is written from a very, very specific and small point of view. And it's usually a Western point of view. And a lot of it is written by let's face it, white men. So, you know, the, the interest of the world waking up to somebody like Pasita and to a whole bunch of other artists, um, yeah. it just is testament that this work, which, you know, was created alongside a lot of the canons, um, is just as important. And I think that's why all the museums around the world are getting so excited about Pasita because she was making this for herself. You know, and, um, and, and, and all of the scholarship that she, the scholarly work that she did to preserve her pieces, conserve them, you know, document everything, um, all of that is we are super grateful for because these pieces were made almost 40 years ago. And here they are looking fresh and looking ready for people in the, in the 21st century to see them. Hmm. So with that, I'd like to thank yeah. you, Pio. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thanks, everyone, for, for coming. Thank you to everyone. Um, we are so happy that you could join us. Uh, I do hope morning, that you can watch. Good afternoon, good evening. <laughs> yes, good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Uh, you can watch this on our YouTube channel. I think it will be up by tomorrow. Uh, that's just search for Silverlands. Uh, so thank you. And from Manila, from London, good night. Yeah. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. <laughs> Bye, Pio.